Uh, it's my distinguished uh, <coughs> honor and privilege to introduce um, our speaker for this um, afternoon session, uh, addressing a topic which um, I believe needs to be uh, front and center of uh, this uh, conference. I would not pretend or deceive you to, uh, to think that uh, an hour session of our lunch is going to tell you everything that uh, the community needs uh, to be involved with or their roles in, um, in, in human research uh, protection. Um, but I will tell you that we need to find a way to bring the community into this um, discussion. Um, the, the session that just ended uh, was a nice uh, segue into, into this one. I uh, especially uh, enjoyed um, <coughs> Dr. Dr. Sharp's uh, comment that uh, many times when we're talking about what does community cares about, as people who live in the academic world, we think more, mostly about compliance. Um, to the community, compliance is important, yet they want to know that there are policies and committees and structures in place to ensure that uh, people play according to the rules. <clears throat> but it's more than compliance. It's about trustworthiness. And if we cannot bring communities into these uh, discussions at, um, with the goal of um, establishing trust, um, it's almost that, like, that all the things we've talked about um, are diminished. And it gets all the more uh, <coughs> complicated when you think that uh, when we talk about commu uh, community, it's not just one community. Um, it, whether it's ethnic you know, communities, it's not just one um, community. So I'm you know, hoping that uh, you are in for a very um, engaging and interesting uh, presentation this afternoon. Um, our speaker is uh, uh, Dr. Uh, Vanessa Nottington uh, Gambo, who is an MD, uh, PhD. Um, she is a university professor of medical uh, humanities and professor of health uh, policy and American studies at the George Washington University. She is the first woman and African American to hold this prestigious endowed faculty uh, position. Uh, Dr. Gamble is also professor of um, health uh, policy in the Milken Institute of School of Public Health and professor of American Studies in the Columbian College of Arts and Sciences. Uh, Dr. Gamble is adjunct professor of nursing at the University of Pennsylvania School of Nursing. Throughout uh, her career, she has worked to promote equity and justice in medicine and public health. A physician, scholar, and activist, uh, Dr. Gamble is an internationally recognized expert on the history of American medicine, racial and ethnic disparities in health and healthcare, public health ethics, and bioethics. She is the author of several widely acclaimed uh, publications on the history of race and racism in uh, American medicine and bioethics. Public service has been a hallmark of her career. She has served on many boards and chaired the committee that took the lead uh, in successful uh, campaign to obtain an apology in 1997 from uh, President Clinton for the uh, US public health syphilis uh, study at um, Tuskegee. She is a member of the National Academy uh, of Medicine that was formerly known as the Institute of Medicine and a fellow of the Hastings uh, Center. On a personal level, uh, she is a proud uh, native of um, West Philadelphia. Uh, Dr. Gam Dr. Gamble received a BA uh, from Hampshire College and uh, a MD and PhD in the history and sociology of science uh, from the University of uh, Pennsylvania. Uh, please uh, join me in giving uh, a warm Minnesota welcome to Dr. Gamble.
thank you for that warm um, introduction, especially since it's here in Minnesota. I lived 10 and a half years in Wisconsin, and once uh, there was a group of people who asked me what I consider coming to Minnesota, and the response was, why would I come to some place that's even colder than Madison? But I'm really happy to be here uh, today. When I was coming in yesterday, can you hear me, Steve? Okay, they said they can't hear me in the back. When I was coming in uh, yesterday, uh, I said, the limo driver asked me what I was doing here, and I told her. And so she says, what time's your talk? And I said, it was at lunchtime. And I said, you know, that's one of the worst times to have to give a talk. Um, and, and I said, dinner might be even a little uh, less uh, uh, worse too. And she said, why? I said, you know, people are more interested in their food uh, and talking to each other than uh, listening to me. Uh, so I'm here talking about tough duty, trying to be between you and your desserts. Fortunately, I don't eat dessert, so, but, so, I, um, so what I'm going to do today is I'm going to provide an overview of the growing importance of community-engaged research and medical research. I'm a historian, and as a historian, I always want to say, why are we here at this moment? You know, 20 years ago, we were not talking about community-engaged research the way we are today. And to discuss some of the opportunities, tensions, and challenges in conducting community-engaged uh, research and analyze some of the ethical issues in community-engaged research, especially in communities of color, and to examine research in the context of changing community demographics and contemporary politics. Now, the last thing that, that Cola said when he read my bio sketch was, I'm a proud native of West Philadelphia. And I went to Penn. And I want to start there. Because I was one, I grew up, actually, and I was, grew up in the shadow of an academic medical center. I was actually born in that academic medical center. I was born at Penn. And I grew up in a community where my family has lived for four generations. We were poor, but we took care of each other. We were a community where that, yes, we had our problems, but we had care and nurturing. It was not until I got to Penn that I realized that the community was a problem, that I was one of the community people. And I'm like, yes, but I didn't know what a community person meant. And in that context, it usually meant someone who was non-compliant with therapy, somebody who uh, was not well educated or was problematic. And the reason I wanted to start here today is one, to let you know who I am and what I do. But my growing up in West Philadelphia has driven my life and my career. So I am here not just as a scholar, but as a community person. Okay, let's talk about the growth of uh, community-engaged uh, uh, research. As I said, you know, why are we talking about it now? And I see, a, you know, a, a, a few things, but let's talk about what's meant by community-engaged research. And, and community engagement is the process of working collaboratively with and through groups of people affiliated by geographic proximity, special interests, could be religion, or sim a similar situations to address issues affecting the well-being of these people. It's not what we were talking about today in terms of individual clinical research. We're talking about working with and through communities, which is a very different paradigm. And so I want to talk about why there has been this growth. And I think there's four reasons. Federal mandates, some of the initiatives to eliminate racial and ethnic inequities in health and healthcare. Funding opportunities, as Jeff Bodkin said this morning, that you know money can be a good incentive, uh, and community demands. Federal, let's start with federal mandates. 
The National Institutes of Health uh, Revitalization, Revitalization Act of 1993 was designed to address disparities in the, the participation of clinical trials. And it was to get more women and minorities included in clinical research. So in working with communities of color, that it was the, the, uh, this uh, act that helped trying to diversify uh, clinical trials. But sociologist Stephen Epstein talks about what it has also done is something he calls recruitmentology, which is a new field of empirical study that seeks to develop scientific evidence about the best way to successfully enroll the so-called hard to recruit populations. And we hear a lot about these hard to recruit pop populations, you know, talking about trust, talking about being culturally competent to try to get more people of color in clinical trials. And I'll say some more about that later. Another factor that has led to the uh, increase in community-engaged research are some of the initiatives to eliminate racial um, and ethnic diversity uh, inequities in health and healthcare. Now, I want to start here, but I'm going to go off point for a few minutes to uh, talk about one of my pet peeves. If bear with me for a second. I spent three years at Tuskegee University being the head of the bioethics center there. And one of the things that being at Tuskegee really got me very adamant about is the use of the term Tuskegee to just mention the syphilis study. <laughs> that it, Tuskegee University has done more than be involved in a syphilis study. If you're lucky, people might know about the airmen. And then, you know, a few years ago, Lawrence Fishburne was in a HBO movie about the syphilis study and then about the airmen, and then some people thought that airmen were in the syphilis study, so it got, you know, it really got things um, really confused. But the reason I say this is that there was a history of helping black people in terms of healthcare at Tuskegee Institute and later university, which people don't know about because all they hear is Tuskegee syphilis study. The other thing is, when we did some focus groups, that people thought Tuskegee had done all the work for the syphilis study. They were involved, yes, and no one knows about the public health service. So, President Clinton apologized in May 1997 for the syphilis study at Tuskegee, not the Tuskegee syphilis study. So I just wanted to, even though that's a little off point, if you have a microphone, use it. My mother said always, uh, you know, um, speak up. Uh, and it worked until I used it against her. Now, anyway, so the survivor, so one, one of the things that the reason that those of us who fought to have a, an apology was some of the issues that have come up earlier about lack of trust uh, in communities of color about research. And so we thought that in the African American community, having the president say he was sorry for the syphilis study would be an important step. And at that meeting, uh, at the apology, President Clinton directed uh, Donna Shalala, who was then head of Health and Human Services, to issue a report that how best to involve communities especially minority communities and research in healthcare. And there were some other initiatives that came up in terms of racial and ethnic disparities in communities. The REACH 19, the REACH 2010 um, uh, initiative that was in 1998, and that supported community coalitions in designing, I want to start there, designing, implementing, and evaluating community-driven strategies. So it's not when a researcher comes in and says, look, we've done this, what do you think? Is that being at the table at the beginning. And in the report that came out after the uh, apology for the syphilis study, the community's report was enhancing community participation to restore trust. So the focus is not just on individuals, but communities. Um, there are other uh, partnerships that, uh, um, that uh, came up. 
One of the things that has driven a lot of the work in racial and ethnic uh, uh, inequities is the work that David Satcher did when he was first at uh, CDC and then at Health and Human Services and helped President Clinton to establish a race and health initiative in terms of trying to eliminate these uh, uh, disparities. Healthy People 2010, which I was involved in in the late 1990s in terms of trying to think of what would be the, the agenda for healthcare uh, in the future. And that also emphasized community partnerships. So that the word, so thinking about community, the importance of community has developed part and parcel with the growth of the interest in eliminating racial and ethnic disparities. The Institute of Medicine report that came out in 2003 that basically showed many, many studies that showed that, that in this case, mostly focusing on African Americans, that the quality of care, the lack of access to care that people get because of the color of their skin. And what was very interesting to talk with people when this came out was a, that people would say, I always thought it was about insurance. But there are studies that have shown that people of color with insurance getting into the doors of our academic health centers are treated differently. So one of the things that the work in disparities has shown is, and this is the, you know, um, the Grim Reaper at the door of a black man saying, you'll be happy to know that race played no part in this decision. Now those of us who do work in racial and ethnic inequities know that race is the Grim Reaper, Reaper is gonna come for all of us, but when the Grim Reaper comes is based on your race and ethnicity. So now there's funding opportunities. In the NIH Clinical and Translation, uh, 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 Translational Science Awards and the TCSA's programs, it has part of its mandate that engaging communities in clinical research. PCORI, which is a patient-centered outcomes research institute, also has funding grants. And also in NIH, the National Center for Advancing Translational Sciences has grants for doing community engagement. Also community demands. There have been problems with, uh, and Jeff brought this up uh, earlier, in the Havasupai um, Indian tribe case where um, uh, bio, uh, bio specimens were misused and community had not given consent for their uh, uses for uh, a, a, a wide variety of uh, reasons. They thought that they were doing a diabetes study, but it was used for other studies, uh, including schizophrenia. And so some Native American uh, tribes now say that if you won't let us review the research before it's done, you can't do research in our communities. So we have federal mandates, initiatives to um, in, uh, decrease racial and ethnic disparities in health care, uh, um, and, and community demand and funding opportunities. Why at this moment we are talking about this. So there's a continuum of community engagement mechanisms, and this is from the principles of community uh, engagement, uh, which is, this comes out from the CTSI. And you see that it goes from outreach, remember the old outreach, you go and it's almost like being a missionary. Sometimes you just go out, you're there to help the people of color, you know, and then you, you know, feel good until the next time you're feeling charitable. Um, and so there's some community involvement, all the way to where there's shared leadership. Several years ago, I was doing a site visit for the Robert Wood Johnson Clinical Investigator, uh, Clinical Scholars Award. And they said they wanted people, the new scholars, to be involved in community-engaged research. And that we had to evaluate the centers on that. So we go to some site visits, and it was clear that some folks, they just met when they put the grant together. Or 
they might have met um, that day. You know, it was clear, and I see some knowing um, nods out there, you know, it's like, almost like, let the church say amen, um, that it was, it was clear that there was no real collaboration. There was no shared leadership. We went to another site visit where there were members of the community running the site visit. And being as skeptical as I am, I knew the two community folks. And I said, you know, at a break, oh, tell me, you know, is this real? And then I said, you know, is this just for this grant? You know, is this, is this, is this, you just showboating or you just, and they said, no, it's real. And one of them is, is out in Los Angeles, is a very active um, uh, community organizer. She says it's real, but it took time for us to get to the shared leadership model. It took time. It took some folks getting their feelings hurt. Sometimes it took going back. Sometimes it's admitting that it was a failure, but continuing to go. So that's one, you know, doing community engaged research is very, very difficult. It's very time consuming. And something that Richard Sharp said earlier today, which is true, not a lot of people are doing it well. I don't know I, any model that say, this is the place that's doing it best. But people are trying and people are working uh, at it. So I just want to show you what are some of the, the models. And here's another way of looking at the community engaged research continuum. Less community uh, involvement where it is predominantly investigated or driven to complete community involvement where it's community uh, uh, driven research. This is what PCORI talks about uh, when it talks about engagement in research. It encourages awardees to engage patients and other stakeholders at every stage in terms of planning the study, conducting the study, and disseminating the study. This is from the President's Commission for the Study of Bioethical Issues, and in 2013, they issued a report on community engagement. And engagement allows community members to articulate concerns or priorities to be able to say, this is something that's important in our community, or I don't know what this is all about. Why are you here talking with us about this? Express concerns. Identify vulnerable populations within the communities. Because one of the things, I was gonna to get to this later, but I think it's a good time to talk about now, is what's meant by community? How are you defining community? Aren't academic medical centers in a community? Because sometimes it's like, it's the us and them. I mean, so usually, you know, that even within the communities around uh, academic health centers, that there are, it's not monolithic. And it's not just how you are defining community, it's how you're framing communities. Is the definition that hard to reach population? Or is the definition of the group that's the problem? lives in the bad neighborhood. So, I mean, it's also, it's perceptions of communities and also definitions of communities. And also, community, having community members um, can also help identify um, implications or complications of the consequences of the research on the community. And it also allows the research participants to consider more thoroughly the risks and benefits. The other thing, that the, the, uh, the Presidential Commission does not talk about, but I firmly believe is that it also allows the communities to be teachers of the researchers. That the community has assets, they have knowledge, they have in, uh, information that, can, that they can teach uh, to, uh, to the researchers. So this cartoon is, you can see I have a New Yorker subscription. They're harmless when they're alone, but get a bunch of them together with a research grant and watch out. That's how some folks feel about research that, uh, and, and researchers. So here is 
the voices of some community members. Researchers come into our community, they study us, they get what they want from us, and then they're gone. We're left with the same thing we had, whether it's obesity or environmental diseases or what have you. You come in, you write your papers, you get your grant money, you go away, and nothing here changes. Sometimes it's even worse. So the question of for whose benefits? Whose benefit is the research for? Is it for someone just to get their, their grants, their promotions? Or is it to improve the lives and the health of communities? Here's another one. Why am I in such demand as a research subject when no one wants me as a patient? Now, we can spend a lot of time deconstructing this one. Because you can't get health insurance, you don't have physician, but someone wants you for as in a research protocol. So let's talk about some of the challenges. I already talked about the definition and framing of community. The other thing is how do you move from the focus, which was so much a part of, of this morning's conversation, of moving from an individual to moving to working with a community. What should that relationship look like? We heard this morning about you know, some of the ethical codes, about you know, the Belmont principles. What should be the principles when you work with communities? Do we take the Belmont principles and just try to revise them as some people have tried to do? Or do we need a new set of principles? So a lot of the things I'm raising today are questions that need to be answered um, as we move forward to working with communities. And what measures are needed to increase IRB competence and community-engaged research? Now we heard this morning about some of the, you know, the, uh, some of the issues. But how do you, what ha happens when you get community-engaged research there? What happens when you have a junior faculty member who's involved in community-engaged research and it takes time, as I said, and they won't get as many publications done? Or the, or the Promotions and Tenure Committee does not know how to deal with a portfolio that has community-engaged uh, research. This is the one that I, I said, uh, I mentioned briefly. Are the Belmont principles adequate? Or even if they are expanded? Yale's um, CTSA tried to do this, and so they took the Belmont principles and added community, respect for community. What's the impact of the research on the community itself and recognition of the diversity of community perspectives? If you do research, on say a sexual transmitted disease in a particular community, is that community going to be, as was in the syphilis study, where black people were thought of as a syphilis-soaked race? So what's gonna be the uh, uh, impact on the community? Beneficence, should the research, you know, how does it benefit um, the community or harm communities? And justice, so sharing of benefits sharing of leadership, sharing of results. Many times community members will, will complain that they came in, they did the research, and we never heard anything else. What happened with it? In terms of some of the other ethical issues are, do communities and individuals need to consent for the research? So how do you ad identify the community member? Is it the person who the, has the loudest mouth? Is, or who, you know, how do you select who is the community representative? Um, and, um, you know, as I said, what is community, uh, how do you s select these folks? And what are the roles? I mean, some places have community advisory boards. Others have uh, more community engaged um, a, a research board. How do you control the power? There's a power dynamic. How do you control that? What are some of the mechanisms to uh, alleviate that? And I'm going to spend some more time, uh, uh, sometime um, shortly, talking about trust. Pokori says there should be, these are their guiding principles of community engagement. Honesty, transparency, reciprocal relationships, co-learning, 
partnership, and trust. Let's talk about trust, because it's a critical component of community-engaged research. Now, Ruha Benjamin, who's a sociologist and a bioethicist, talks about we need to depathologize distrust, especially when we talk about communities of color. Because many times, we talk about communities of color as that they are inherently distrustful. That, and she says, we need to stop thinking of it that way. Now, I'm always amazed um, when you know, I hear bioethicists talk about the reasonable person. Because my question is, how, do you, how are you defining a reasonable person? What objectives are you using? Whose criteria are you using for a reasonable person? Okay? Well, for some people, I want to use that today. But for some people, being a reasonable person might not, ha you might have, you might, in your experience, has led you not to trust the medical center or other community institutions. So that I think that we have to think about it in terms of, you know, there are different categories of trust. So a person can trust their physician, they can trust the nutritionist, they can trust the nurse, but still not trust the institution. You might trust the police officer who helped you last night, but you might not trust the police. So that I think that we have to you know, look at these and, and break them down. Bioethicist and chaplain Lavira Crawley says we should talk about trustworthiness. And that if we keep focusing on just trust in the minority communities, it promotes the stereotype of, 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 of people of color as distrustful. But she also defines distrust as a breach of trust. That institutions need to ask, what have you done to deserve trust? Not to, th not to expect trust. So I just want to talk some about building trustworthy and sustainable relationships. Acknowledgement that people's history can have, make them be reasonable persons and not trust um, uh, medical institutions. And the importance of community attitudes and history. That if you are an undocumented immigrant, that you might think the hospital is, uh, is representing the state. And the need for community engagement and consultation during all stages of the research again and again and again. You need to dem demonstrate the benefits of the research to the community. That it's something f to the community that you did not, you're not bringing uh, to them. And this whole thing of viewing this as a long term. Acknowledge that everybody is bringing some type of expertise. Understanding the priorities and expectations of each partner. Frequent and continuous communications. So let's talk about research in the context of community De changing community demographics. Because one of the things people said, let's use cultural competence. Let's use cultural competence as a way of getting communities of color and research. I want to say that the US Public Health Service syphilis study was one of the most culturally competent studies there were. And this is a definition of cultural competence. Because the study, as many of you know, went from 1932 to 1972. It was a study of untreated syphilis sponsored by the Public Health Service. They use things that, think about when you're thinking about your clinical trials. Use the black church, go to a black school, use black investigators. So that I want you to think about that there are some ethical challenges in talking about cultural competence. 
that it can also be lead to exploitation of communities. One of the, I'm starting to think more and more about cultural humility. And it is a form of, of, of communities and, and of physicians and hospitals working together. It grew out of conflict, this model. It grew out of the Simi Valley verdicts then in terms of after, after the beating of Rodney King where there is riots all over this country. And Children's Hospital Oakland said, we need to do something about this. They created a multicultural health office, and they, on two uh, pediatricians there, developed this model of cultural humility. And the reason why I like this model is that it says that we all have to commit to self-evaluation. We all don't know it all. That we have to be humble, show humility when we go into communities. And, it's, and it focuses on developing mutually beneficial partnerships. And it's not like competence, it's not a discrete endpoint, but a commitment to active engagement in a lifelong process that individuals enter onto an ongoing uh, basis. Now, my final. New Yorker cartoon, and it is the elephant in the room. And it's like, it says, I'm right there in the room, and no one even acknowledges me. So I'm going to talk about an elephant in the room. And this, how do we do research in the context of the Black Lives Matters movement? So earlier this year, Mary Bassett, who is head of the New York uh, um, Department of Health, wrote an article in that very radical journal, <laughs> the New England Journal of Medicine, talking about Black Lives Matter, a challenge to the medical and public health communities. And I urge you all to read it. Because what Dr. Bassett, who talks about her work, but also as her life as a mother of black children. That she powerfully and eloquently wrote about the strong moral and professional obligation to encourage critical dialogues and actions on issues of racism and health, and also to reach out to our communities. Because if we are serious about eliminating racial and ethnic inequities. We cannot just use a medical model. That one of the things has changed as I've done this work is that we are now talking not just, I used to spend all my time talking of medical people about inequities. Now I spend time talking of criminal justice folks, income inequality folks, educational inequality. So that when you think about working in communities, it cannot just be about healthcare. We need to think about this broader. And being at an institution such as the University of Minnesota gives you the options with work of all people from different uh, 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 areas and disciplines. So the community is a source of strength. It's a source of knowledge. It's a source of expertise. And if you are seriously interested in doing community engaged research, you have to come in with that attitude and not like, we're from the government, we're here to help you. So my final slide is from a very well known philosopher and bioethicist, Cedric the Entertainer. And Cedric the Entertainer says, what are you going to do about it? And I'm going to change that, is what are we going to do about it? Thank you very much. Um, 
I think we have time for um, a couple questions. Um, uh, just to indicate by raising your hand if you have uh, a question. Yes, there's a hand up there. Uh, let's get, get um, the mi microphone. Well defined, um, but but I worry about the definition of community. Um, if it's not a discrete and insular community, if one empowers the community to restrict access to that community around research, how do you define that? You know, is it's one thing to say, well, you know, it's in the Harlem community, or is it, you know, Ashkenazi Jews for other kinds of um, uh, 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 research questions that have impact that group, and how do we go about defining community so that it's robust, respectful, but still allows members within it to also have an independent voice? Well, first of okay. all, one of the things I said is that you have to define the communities, and it's not, it's not carved in stone. So yes, it could be Harlem, but it could also be Latinos in Harlem. That's a distinct community. And so that's part of the discussion on what you are looking at. I think a lot of times, it's interesting that you said to allow members of the community to have an independent voice, because right now, they're not seen of having independent voices. And like a part of this is that they can disagree, because it's like a lot of times, I think now they're seen as a monolith in that part of this process for each of the different studies that you might do is how are we defining our community? How is the community defining itself, which might be in conflict with what the, um, the, um, um, the health center? Also, community could be patient advocates. That it could be, you could, your community could be people who are looking at a particular disease. That's what a lot of the PCORI for, uh, work is about. So I think, that, you, that community engaged research is here, and that as part of that process is the whole definition of, about it. So one of the other ethical issues is, you know, that it can come up, say here in Minnesota, you have a Somali, you know, uh, population. What happens if you have someone who's an interpreter working in a research, and you find out something that, uh, about a group member? Um, that you know because it's a small community. So that those are some of, of, of the challenges in working with communities. And I don't think it's a politically inappropriate uh, question, but the thing is, what I always find is that people ask that about communities. You know, how do you define community? But, you know, today we heard so much about research ethics and about some of the ambiguity about that and working to try to make it better. And it was seen that that was acceptable to do. But that sometimes when people talk about communities and stuff, it's like, well, how can I do this? So that's, that's, that's where I sometimes have problems with folks. Uh, yes, we'll take one more question and then uh, I'll read one from the um, webcast. Yes. Yes, my name is Sandra Crump. And I have a question about um, engaging community prior to funding. Do you have any suggestions about how you can get community involved prior to funding um, so that you have them in the leadership role from the beginning? I mean, that's when some of the people who, who are out there on the ground running start talking about getting, having connections with different groups in the in, in different communities before uh, before a research project uh, that it might be about working on improving a school it might be so that people are seen before in the com in various communities 
if you want, you know, and how you, um, how people are in various communities beforehand. So then when, then you might also find out what the community's healthcare needs are. What are their interests? And before you write, you know, the grant. So a lot of people, so that's why I said it has to be broader than healthcare in terms of getting, you know, these connections. You want to read that? Yeah, so this is a question from the uh, web, uh, webcast. Um, as researchers, we cannot always do right by the communities with whom we work because our grants come and go. How can this be ad addressed ethically and with integrity in community engaged projects, especially early slash pilot stages of research when long-term sustainability and benefits to the community are not are unpredictable at best? Let me say, I have to. One of the things is that, I mean, this is a challenge. I mean, this question brings up some of the things that happen when you know you have a short term grant and it's a pilot. Um, and that's why I think it's important to have sustaining commitments and working in community that's just not focusing on one grant and that that so that so that you stay you might be doing something else working with the community one of the things is you know in turn you know public schools in this country are in bad shape so what about having a program to help kids in education as you're doing your research as part, not just you, but, but the institution, so that it's not seen that you're just there for this one study, but you're there for the long-term benefits of a particular community. Well, I wish we have more time, uh, but please uh, join me in thanking uh, Dr. Gamble. <laughs>